Kanika. We are both uh, software engineers in the streaming platform team at Lyft. Um, today, we will be talking about uh, how we are solving some uh, real-time processing challenges using uh, stream processing. Um, so this is uh, okay. So this is a rough agenda for our talk today. So we will start with some uh, some use cases, and then we'll talk about some concepts of stream processing and also some of the interesting challenges that we faced when setting up stream processing programs and how we are uh, solving those. So um, let's start with some use cases. So I hope most of you have used uh, Lyft at some point or the other. Uh, we are a ride-sharing company. Our goal is to uh, match passengers with drivers. And we want our drivers and passengers to be really happy with our platform. And that means short ETAs. We want to make sure our drivers are being paid fairly, while at the same time making sure that our passengers are not being overcharged for their rides. And we also want to make sure that our users have a good experience on the platform. Um, and this might mean uh, timely notifications and so on. Um, to achieve any of these use cases, we make a lot of decisions in real time. Um, for example, in case of pricing, um, we have dynamic pricing and we take into account uh, real time supply demand curves and ETAs and so on. And these change a lot based on traffic and many other things. So we want to make sure that we are making these decisions in real time. Um, we also want to combat fraud on the platform because there can be real monetary consequences. And we want to make sure our users are getting notified if their ride is getting delayed or if there's an ETA mismatch, um, any of those. On the driver side of things, we want to make sure our drivers are uh, earning well on our platform and also getting more uh, rides. This means that we want to make sure that they are directed to places where there is a high supply, for example or we want to make sure they're getting their bonuses fairly. So some of our bonus structures involve, like for example, counting ride streaks. So depending on whether the uh, number of rides they completed in the last maybe a day or week, they get bonuses. So we want to make sure these are counted accurately and bonuses are fair, uh, paid well. Um, so for, to solve all in, or any of these problems, we generate a lot of events on our platform, and we use stream processing to do these computations in real time. And Micah will be talking about it. Uh, yeah, so uh, as Sharon mentioned, real-time data is really, really important uh, when you're a real-time business like Lyft, where people you know, expect to uh, pull out their phone and be able to get a ride immediately. Uh, so uh, to kind of talk through kind of what we mean by stream processing, what these systems look like, kind of start where most of us started with data processing. These are uh, batch processing systems. So the basic idea here is we have some, some system producing events. In the case of Lyft, this is our mobile apps, both on the passenger and the driver side, which uh, as a user pulls out their phone and starts uh, looking at destinations, eventually books a ride, uh, all these things are, are producing events back to our system. Similarly, as a driver drives around the city, uh, we're getting continual pings from their phone telling us exactly where they are so that we can match them with riders. So as all this data is coming into our system, uh, it goes to some data store, data lake, uh, HDFS, S3, HBase, uh, and then periodically users can query it using a system like MapReduce or uh, Presto or Hive. Uh, maybe you have some automated system that's querying it every day and generating features for your ML pipelines or whatever. Uh, and this works well for a lot of use cases. It's very scalable, up to petabytes of data. Uh, and uh, it's fairly straightforward for users to, to use. But for a lot of use cases like ours, it's, it's just too slow. Uh, you know, if uh, there's an accident on the highway and it takes us a day to learn about it and to update our ETA systems, you know, that's just too slow. We can't tell a user that their car is coming in five minutes when there's a giant flaming truck on the highway. Uh, so, so Lyft realized uh, about a year ago that we needed to be faster uh, in a lot of the things we, uh, we do. So we started turning to uh, stream processing. 
So stream processing is a, a different way to compute things on data, where instead of kind of collecting a whole lot of data and then every hour or every day uh, doing some computation on it, instead, as the data streams in, we do computation on every single event. For every event that comes in, in you know, real time, we are updating our current state of the world. So for Lyft, this might mean uh, deciding how many drivers and passengers there are in a particular part of the city so we can uh, decide whether we're going to turn on prime time or not. It might be deciding that a user is trying to defraud our system and we should block their account. All this stuff uh, happens uh, immediately. And the, the time scale we're talking about here is, is often milliseconds or seconds. So uh, stream processing requires thinking about your computations a little bit differently than uh, you might be used to for batch. So we're just going to go through a few of these concepts that, that come in uh, when you start moving towards stream processing. So first of all, you're probably going to want to divide up your data into time in some way. There's a, a few different ways people do this. Uh, the simplest to understand is a fixed window where we have, say, you know, data from 5 o'clock to 5.01, 5.01 to 5.02, and we do some computation over each of those windows. Uh, slightly more elaborate is a sliding window where we still have a fixed length window, like say five minutes, but the window slides by say a minute uh, so that we can get some notion of history while still updating it on a regular basis. And then we get to more interesting things like session windows where we're connecting all the activity for a particular user. So for example, everything that happens when a user pulls out their phone, selects a destination, orders a lift, a session window could connect all of that and do some computation on the, the whole kind of uh, user session. Uh, so these are like nice high level concepts uh, that allow us to like simply express uh, some of the, the things that like uh, application developers might want. Like uh, you know, an ML engineer might say, I want to know how many cars there are in this part of the city in the last five minutes. Um, and that's a, a nice like high level thing to be able to express. But there's a lot of challenges in actually computing that. Uh, in particular, in a streaming system, like data is delayed. It's out of order. It's a particular challenge for Lyft because like, our data comes from our mobile apps. And mobile apps are on slow cellular connections. Uh, they might be buffered by the app. They might uh, be offline for a time period. So you know, we might get events that are arbitrarily delayed. Uh, but we still need to be able to, to do these computations in a timely way. So uh, the solution uh, that uh, uh, people have come up with for this problem is uh, to introduce uh, something called a watermark. And to explain what that is, uh, we first have to kind of formalize time in a stream processing application. So we actually have two different notions of time here. We have the event time, which is the time the event actually occurred. And then we have processing time, which is the time that our system saw the event. Ideally, you know, these would be basically the same, with maybe some delay. Uh, but in practice, uh, you can see this reality line kind of zigs and zags and kind of be all over the place. So uh, in order to like, not wait forever to do our computations, because we don't know when the data we need, say, for our 5 PM to 501 window, uh, we don't know when that data will be there, but we still need to decide to like, do our computation at some point. Uh, so modern stream processing systems introduce something called a watermark, which basically tells us when we think all the data for a particular time period has arrived. So you can think of a watermark as an estimate that at a given time, we've received all the data prior to that time. So uh, to visualize this a little bit better, uh, the, the uh, Google Dataflow team put together this great uh, visualization um, that shows uh, what happens as a watermark kind of moves through time. So here we're, we're doing an integer sum over events uh, for a two minute fixed window. And as these events come in, uh, you can see uh, with the, uh, the processing time bar, uh, we're summing them up. Then we have this, uh, this green watermark that we're estimating when we've received all of the events. Once that gets to the end of the window, we can close out the window and compute uh, the, uh, the data. Of course, data might still be late. right? We have this random nine point that comes in. 
uh, you know, a minute later. Uh, and then we have to handle that in some way. There's, there's basically two strategies. You either just drop the data if you've already used the computation, or you can try to update the existing window uh, and, and kind of re-output that to whatever system is consuming this. So uh, at Lyft, uh, to actually write these stream processing applications, uh, we've settled on Apache Flink, which is a uh, general data processing system. Uh, Sharon's going to talk a little bit more about um, so, at Lyft, we are using stream, uh, Apache Flink for stream processing. So, what is Flink? Um, Flink is a framework that allows stateful computation on bounded as well as uh, unbounded streams of data. It can scale to millions of events per second, and also terabytes of state can be managed. Flink also supports event time processing, uh, and this is really important for our use cases. As Michael mentioned, a lot of events are generated on mobile platforms, and they are batched and sent to our event ingestion pipelines. <clears throat> uh, fault tolerance and exactly one semantics are also supported, which is, and this is made possible by Flink's checkpointing mechanism. Uh, checkpoint is essentially a snapshot of a state of a Flink program at any point, and that also includes a position in the, uh, in the input stream that is being read. So this is a simple word count example for, uh, for Flink in Scala, and what this is doing is it's uh, streaming in a text and uh, counting the number of words in a window of, over a window of five seconds. Flink also supports specifying computation or aggregation in terms of SQL. So in this example, a data stream is being read as a table, and the aggregation is specified in terms of the SQL query. And this is, we, a lot of programs at, um, at Lyft uses this uh, uh, Flink SQL. So um, at Lyft, we have, right now, we have more than 50 uh, Flink jobs running in production. Tens of millions of records are being processed per second. Um, it's currently deployed in our EC2 instances using our custom tooling and custom deployment methods. We have also been working on getting Flink on Kubernetes. That work is in progress. Um, most of our uh, feature generation for ML models are powered by Flink SQL. Um, another thing about like Lyft engineers, so at Lyft, Python is the primary language that is being used. Um, Flink currently supports APIs in Scala, Java, uh, SQL. So in order, so we don't want our engineers to have to learn Java to write Flink programs. So for this, we have been working on supporting Beam at Lyft. And Beam is, a, is basically a unified programming model that can, that can be used to write batch and stream programs, and uh, Flink as a runner is supported, and SDKs in uh, Python is available, for example. And also, it supports, uh, it has support for complex windowing and triggering um, uh, uh, methods. So um, now let's talk about some of the challenges, like interesting challenges that we faced and how we solved them. So first, I want to talk a little bit about bootstrapping. So what exactly is bootstrapping. So for that, let's look at an example. So this is a Flink SQL program that, that's counting the number of rides canceled per passenger over a period of seven days. So the window here is seven days. So what will happen if we start this program today and, uh, and it starts consuming live events? Uh, for this program to be able to answer the query correctly, it needs to run for a period of seven days, process that data in order to answer the query correctly. And waiting is the hardest part. What happens if after seven days, we realize that we needed a change in the business logic? So we can't really like start it now and start building the state from today. How about total cancels since the beginning of Lyft? For this, we'll have to go back in time and start this program, the day lift started. Um, so this is where bootstrapping comes in. So instead of building the state today using live events, what we do is we read historic data to build the state and bootstrap the program. 
and then uh, we up keep updating the state as live, live events come in. So now our program returns results on day one. Um, at Lyft, historic data is uh, stored in S3, and live events come in through uh, Kinesis pipelines. Uh, but Kinesis has a retention period of seven days. So if the window is longer than seven days and we want to process historic data, we cannot rely on like just Kinesis. So we also have to read events from S3. Um, and there were two things we wanted to, uh, there were two requirements we had when we were building this. So first is we want bootstrapping to be fast. So when the program is bootstrapping, a bulk of data is being processed. So it can, it can be a slow process. But we were willing to add more resources to make it go fast. Once bootstrapping is over and the program transitions to the steady states and starts processing live events, the amount of data that is being processed obviously reduces. And at this point, we want to um, reduce the resources to save, save cost. So this is the first iteration of the solution that we came up with. So what we did was we essentially had two separate programs for bootstrapping as well as uh, and a steady state. So we would first run uh, a high provision job that would read historic data from S3, perform, uh, apply a business logic on it right to the sink. Once we know that we have finished processing historic events, and we uh, know this based on watermarks, we take a snapshot of this program, cancel this program. Now we start a low provision job using this snapshot that we just created, and this program would read from Kinesis and process live events, apply the same business logic right to sync. And this worked for a lot of, most of our cases, but there was a disadvantage. So in Flink, uh, in order to apply a snapshot, the requirement is that operator UIDs uh, should not change. So since we had these two separate programs over here, so they, Flink allows setting UIDs manually, but a lot of our programs used Flink SQL. So the operators had auto-generated UIDs. And secondly, if the shape of the program changes, then it's harder to reapply the snapshot. So this method was really clunky, and uh, m not all our problems were solved. So this is the solution that we came up with next. So what we did was, instead of having these two separate programs, we combined the two. So now this job reads old historic data from S3. It reads live events from Kinesis, unions the two, applies business logic, and writes to sync. Um, once we know that historic data has been pro pro uh, processed, and we determine this on the basis of a watermark. So, what, so here, that green line is the watermark that's moving forward. So when we know when the watermark moves uh, past the target time, we know the old historic data has been processed. So at this point, we take a snapshot of this program, um, cancel it, and restart, it, uh, restart a much lower provision job uh, using the snapshot. So when our program starts, it's a higher provision job with high parallelism, but after bootstrapping is over, we use the snapshot to restart it uh, with a lower parallelism. And this worked really well. Like uh, right now, we are using this method in production. Um, an advantage is that it's a single program. It's seamless. We have external automation to detect bootstrapping based on watermark, and we are saving on resources. Um, however, the disadvantage is that when, since we are unioning data from both, so Kinesis, the live events coming through Kinesis are not being used until all the historic data has been processed. And this data was being buffered. And uh, this, this is a limitation that we'll be talking about next. So because of this data being buffered, in case of like programs having large windows, this was causing performance degradation. And this is a common problem in any scenario where there's a source queue. So we uh, started thinking about this and came up with a solution, and Micah will be talking about it next. Cool, so source queue. Uh, what does this mean? So let's say that we have a partitioned data source like Kafka or Kinesis, 
And each of these partitions has you know, a collection of events that are getting streamed in. Uh, and these events come from you know, different parts of event time. So in a well-behaved system, you know, the oldest events will be at front, the newest events will be you know, at the back, and all the partitions will be basically in sync together. So here, all the, part all the events we're reading off of our uh, partitions, these little circles, are in our like, first window. So here, uh, the little job that is counting just the number of events in a one minute fixed window. So all these events are coming off of our first window, and then you know, we keep reading events, and all the events now are coming off of our second window, which means that we're able to close out that first window. We're able to reduce all of the events to just their sum and throw away the raw data. If we get, uh, Right, and that's great. That means that uh, we're able to uh, output our data to our, uh, our consumers and uh, kind of be done with that period of time. What happens if our partitions are skewed? If uh, one of our partitions has, say, a bunch more older data uh, than our others? In this case, we, we start reading our first window and everything's good. And then we start reading our second window, but we still have data for the first window that's streaming in which means that we won't have gotten our watermark yet, and we can't close out that window. So as we keep getting more data in for newer time windows, uh, these old windows stay around with all of their raw data. Uh, this is really bad in the case that Sharon talked about, where some of our data is coming from a system like S3 and represents historical data. So since all this data is, uh, is streaming in, uh, while we still have the, the live data coming in, we have all of this state that's building up in our application. This causes a bunch of bad effects in Flink. Uh, checkpoints start taking a really long time because we now have to checkpoint all of this data that's been buffered up. Uh, if you're using an in-memory uh, state store, you might actually just run out of memory. And if you're using a disk back store, it's going to be a lot of flushing this data to disk and reading it back in. Uh, so this is really, uh, really bad and has caused a lot of uh, outages and other performance problems at Lyft. Uh, so this became a really high priority for us to fix, and uh, I want to talk through how we, uh, how we address this. So let's look at this kind of from a systems perspective. Uh, a Flink application is made up of a bunch of nodes, and inside each node we have uh, some threads that are consuming off of uh, some different Kinesis partitions. Uh, the way it works in kind of the open source Kinesis uh, reader each thread or each partition has a single thread that's reading off of that uh, that partition and then writing the data to the rest of the system. So the first thing we did was introduce a bounded priority queue uh, after the reader thread. So now uh, the thread reads data off of the partition, it writes it to this queue, and then we have another thread that is choosing the oldest element off of any of these queues and uh, sending just that element to the rest of the system. So what this means is that uh, if one of our partitions becomes skewed and has newer data, it won't be read from. So it just starts building up until uh, it fills up entirely. And then the thread that's reading off of Kinesis can just stop reading from Kinesis. This is great. This means that our data that we're not able to process yet because it's too new is staying in our PubSub system, which has basically infinite retention. Uh, instead of being streamed into our application where we have to store it in memory and check one in, do all this other business. Then, you know, once our other partition catches up, uh, our uh, sender thread starts reading from both queues again and we're able to start consuming from the partition. So zooming out a little bit, uh, more of a, uh, you know, in a real Flink application we have multiple consumers. Um, uh, so we need some way to coordinate them uh, using some shared state. Uh, so we have, uh, in our case, Zookeeper that is uh, maintaining a notion of a global watermark, which is basically the minimum watermark we've seen across any of our consumers. So now as, uh, as our threads are pulling data off of their internal queues, uh, they're periodically also updating this global watermark. Uh, so they update the watermark that gets replicated to the other nodes, and then the other nodes know to only consume and produce if uh, the data that they're, they're seeing is within some bound of that global watermark. 
So here, uh, our current global watermark is, uh, is the oldest time. Um, so if uh, our second consumer starts seeing newer data, it's just going to stop producing to the system, which means that its queues will back up and will stop consuming from our pub sub layer. Uh, and then, of course, once our other consumer catches up, it'll update the watermark, which will uh, update the other consumers, and then uh, they can start consuming again. Uh, so uh, current state of this, uh, we've built it in-house and we're running it. Um, we're also working on contributing it back to the open source community. To be fair, this is a, a common problem that a lot of companies are facing. Uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, follow that uh, Flink Jira. And uh, I think that's all we have for you. So thank you so much. Uh, and I think we have a few minutes for questions. change in the programming model after you did this? Was there a change to how you write and how you implement this in a normal streaming versus combined batch and streaming? S sorry, uh, are you asking about the bootstrapping? bootstrapping? Um, not really. It's the same Flink program. So, um, so bootstrapping here. So we are running the bootstrapping program. That's also a streaming program, and we did think about using batch batching uh, like using the batch model for stream uh, for bootstrapping but the issue there was that there was no easy way to use the snapshot that was just created by a batch program in a streaming program um, so that that was mainly the issue so, there, so we did consider like either using batching for that the other alternative that we considered was using a tiered storage so uh, either like like i think right now i'm aware of apache pulsar that has a tiered storage so in that case we wouldn't need like two different sources that we can read from but yeah so does that answer your question I see. Yeah, so our pop-up systems are, so our pipe, so we are sort of provisioning Kafka right now for our pop um, for like for the event uh, pipelines and so on, but Flink is mainly used for processing, like for any place where we need windowing and aggregation. And where, so for us, like event time processing and exactly once semantics was important. So that was, that was like two main criteria that went into that decision. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. Yeah. So Spark has recently introduced structured streaming, and they're starting to get their latency down. Uh, it wasn't really an option when we made this decision, um, but I'm definitely excited to see that mature. Oh yeah, and also uh, we're heavily adopting Beam, so. Uh, one of the big benefits of Beam is that it lets you write your job once in whatever language and execute it on any uh, execution system. So hopefully that'll give us portability in the future uh, if we decide we want to use different execution systems. Yeah, so in, I, in iteration one, it was actually two different programs. So there was one program that would just read, like that had just one source, which was an S3 source, and the other one a Kinesis source. In the other one, we, we have a source that unions the data from both. So from a user's perspective, they just run this one Flink program, and magically it will just transition from Bootstrap. Well, magically, like we have external automation for that, but yeah, so. <laughs> So one of our largest um, programs is one that we have for fraud, uh, one of our fraud mod that powers one of our fraud models. And what it does is it looks at last 60 days worth of uh, uh, client actions on the app. And client action is like the highest uh, volume event. And for this, bootstrapping took about uh, four hours. So you said that you started using Apache Beam. Are you using 
Uh, no. So our main motivation for adopting Beam is actually to get Python support, because most of the developers at Lyft are Python developers. The data scientists like Python. Um, so that's uh, Python on Flink is super new. We're actively developing it along with Google, um, and so that uh, uh, should be sort of production ready in the next like three to six months. But we're already starting to kind of roll out use cases internally for that. But yeah, uh, I just went to the Shio talk and I thought that was really interesting. So I definitely look interested in like learning more about that. Now, if you just have one partition, then, then there wouldn't be a skew problem. But I mean, at our scales, you always have lots of partitions and potentially multiple data sources, uh, which, which really exacerbates those skew problems. Cool. Uh, if there's no more questions, thank you all for coming. And uh, we are hiring. <laughs> so please reach out to one of us if you're interested in working on some of these problems.